And uh, let's bring in our uh, man of the hour. Our first guest tonight lives by the mantra, it's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice, which is why my mom has always loved him. Uh, he's also the only student athlete in BYU history to play professional baseball in the summer and be a star for Cougar basketball during the winter. And he did that for three years. He led BYU to the Sweet 16 in 1981 and was named National Basketball Player of the Year. He played 14 seasons in the NBA and won three world championships, two as a player and one as an executive. Currently the CEO of the Utah Jazz, proud member of the BYU Hall of Fame, and his number 22 jersey hangs in the rafters at the Marriott Center. Pleasure to welcome the great Danny Ainge to the Wise Guys. Thanks for being here. Good to be here. When you, when you see that jersey up there, and you see it a lot because you come to a lot of games, uh, is it cool every time? Um, I honestly don't look up there very <laughs> often, but when it happened, it was very cool. Yeah. What do you think I don't you got? I think about it much since then, but it was a great experience. But when we look up there and we look at the, uh, you know, all the ones that are up there, that's a, that's a pretty unique and really cool group. That, that is up there. Kreshmer Chosich is up there with you. And Roland Minson. Roland Minson. Our guys Watts. that were part of that NIT group back in back in the fifties, right? Yeah. And then and then Stan Watts up there. So it's a pretty pretty select group up there. Pretty cool group of guys. No, it's very cool. I mean, um, I don't know a lot about all those players, but I do know a lot about Kreshmer and have heard so much about him over my career, and had a chance to watch him once in person, but. Um, yeah, he was very, very special. The only time I've ever been up in the rafters was on a Cub Scout trip. You were up in there? When they let you, they used to take you up there in the in the walking areas on the tour of the Marriott Center. That's about as close as a McCann will be in the rafters. But number 22 was there every time we go. And and as, as, as guys who watched you play, um, and just uh, it's a reminder of, uh, one, how spectacular Jimmer and Tyler had to be to score more points. And we've had both those guys on the show. And they always oh, and, pay tribute to you. And they both acknowledged proactively that you didn't have a three-point line. They both <laughs> said that. They're like, Danny didn't have a three-point line. Well, so I think, I think the amount of games has changed over the years. And I also think maybe more important than the three-point line for scoring is a shot clock. Yeah. Oh, the yeah. shot clock was a big deal uh, for us. We were one of the top scoring teams in the nation, but – Three or four games every year it would, you know, be in the 40s or 30s. I remember one game. I think we beat Hawaii 32 to 30 or something. They just take the ball and play four corners and just hold it. Just well, remember hold, Phil Ford was? They were running those four corners right at yeah. North Carolina. Yeah. Oh man, we did our share of that. You know, with with uh, leads late in games in, in those areas, but um, it certainly is not conducive to lots of scoring. No, and you know what's interesting is back in the day as a kid, when you were a fan and we were running the four court offense to eat the clock, we were all okay with that. It's like, oh, yeah, this is our strategy. Now when you, when you see teams get late in the shot clock, you're like, why haven't they shot three times already? <laughs> right. Well, another thing about scoring, I mean, I see it in the NBA and throughout my whole career, but, I mean, when, um, you know, I don't think it's a coincidence. I averaged like 24 points a game my senior year when Devin wasn't there. Right. Like Devin was a fantastic player. And, uh, you know, we're not going to all, you know, we're all going to score a lot less if we're Devin's playing and Fred's playing and, um, but yeah, who you're playing with matters a lot. Yeah, you you mentioned those guys, and and when we get reminiscing about great teams in the history of BYU sports, period, not just in basketball, I think back to to guys you're talking about, and when you had Greg and Fred and you and Steve Trumbo and Steve Craig, and you know Devin was part of that team before he went on a mission and came back. Um, what an unbelievable group. Of, of talented players that you were with at that time. And we'd be really hard-pressed to find a group across the board as deep with as much talent as that group. What What's your thought? Has, has there been a team that has had the kind of talent that that one had? I don't think so. I mean, Fred, I think, played 14 years in the NBA. And, and Greg, I think, played 12 yeah. or 13 years, Greg Kite. And then, uh, you know, Devin played in the NBA and – Scott Rooney had a terrific career over overseas in Europe. You know, just didn't want to play anymore with family issue things going on. And um, Steve Craig played some yeah. in, in the professional ranks. So yeah, we had a we had a pretty stacked team. Trumbo had a great career over in, in Spain. Yeah, we, we yeah. got a chance to visit with Steve. Yeah, we had, we had a good visit with Steve when he was in. 
Yeah. Steve was, reminds me of Lauren Gustin. Like, there were times when I thought, is Steve going to get every rebound in this game? Like, yeah. he would just go after it. No, he was a rebounding machine. <laughs> no doubt about During it. During your time on campus, you had Jim McMahon and Steve Young playing football and Blaine. Tina yeah, Gunn Blaine, was playing yeah. for the women's <laughs> basketball team. Wally Joyner was on the baseball team. Keith Clearwater and Bobby Clampett were on the golf team. And Marie Osmond was in the student body. What a unique time to be on campus, late 70s, early 80s. What was that like? Well, I mean, first of all, you bring up Marie. She might have been the most important of all that. But, um, <laughs> I remember when I came on my recruiting trip, they, like, made it a point for me to meet Marie. Oh, yeah? She probably has no recollection of any of that. Oh, she will remember, <laughs> believe me. And uh, But anyway, it was, uh, yeah, that was kind of cool. She was a, a star. and But, yeah, I mean, watching Jim McMahon, I mean, I haven't seen a college quarterback that's been more exciting than Jim. Jim played a lot my my sophomore year where Gifford was the quarterback when I first got to BYU. And uh, I, I mean, at one point in my life, I thought about playing college football and, and maybe college baseball would be a better combination. And um, But then, you know, basketball season started and my <laughs> mind changed from week to week. But when I first got here to BYU and I was watching those teams play and yeah. pass the football, I mean, it was killing me. Like, Dang, I could go out there and catch fifteen passes, maybe. I mean, and they know, had so. to have known that Oregon offered you a scholarship to play receiver, mm -hmm. right? Lavelle had to know that. Oh yeah, you were an all-American football oh, I was, player. I was heavily recruited by BYU and Utah okay. and Notre Dame and Michigan State. I was recruited by all the Pac-8 schools in that era for football, uh, mostly as a receiver. Some recruited me as a as a safety, but most recruited me as a receiver. So, what was the what was the difference maker? Why did you decide? Like I said, basketball season started. And <laughs> it was my, just my better. Heart changed, <laughs> and uh, maybe sitting on, standing on the sidelines at an Oregon State football game and just seeing. I mean, I was like six foot four, one hundred sixty five pounds, and I'm going like, oh my gosh, like these guys are huge. Yeah, um, that might add a little bit to do with it too. Isn't it fun though? So, so Danny um, could have played any of those three sports. Um, Obviously, he played two at the professional level, but at wide receiver, he would have filled out. He'd been an NFL wide receiver at that height between 6'4 and 6'5 with a skill set that he had. He's an All-American in high school in that sport as well. Um, but he ends up in basketball, and he just mentioned Giff. Giff came to play basketball, and Lavelle convinced him to come out and play quarterback. Gary Scheide still thinks he came to pitch. Yeah, it's exactly <laughs> right. Gary came here to play baseball, and he ends up playing quarterback there. So sometimes... Whatever's going on just leads you to your path, and then that 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 path goes. With yours, it was because when you know the decision making process had to come later for you. On am I just going to uh, continue to pursue this career in professional baseball, or do I pivot and uh, and go try to make a living playing basketball? How how did that come to pass? I thought I was going to play baseball. I you know I loved baseball. Um, you know, when I, when I got to professional baseball, and I had played for an ex-major leaguer in high school in American Legion and, and played 70-some-odd games each summer from the time I was about 14 years old through my high school career. And I, th I really thought baseball was a longer career. Um, you know, it was a more glamorous career to me at, at a certain point in my life, for sure, when I signed a baseball contract coming out of high school. But... Um, I think that the I learned more in baseball in my professional baseball life in the first three or four months than I had learned my whole life, and uh, you know basketball was different. Like basketball must have been more in my blood, and my brothers played, and my father was a player, and um, you know I never I didn't really feel like I learned that much. I learned the tricks of the trade from the veteran players, but you know it was not near as much. I I, I always knew a lot more about basketball than I did baseball and I guess ultimately my senior year having a good year I just didn't want to I still loved baseball just as much um, I wasn't excited about the NBA especially if it wasn't the Lakers or the Celtics um, but I just I had another year on my contract so you know I was drafted later and, and, and I told everybody I was going to honor that contract and so don't draft me and waste a draft pick but it gave me a lot of leverage and gave me an opportunity to to go to the Celtics, thank goodness. Yeah, because if you if you don't have that hanging over you, you probably don't an, end up at the Celtics. You probably end up some at a team, like I think of Zach Wilson right now, and when, when 
when he gets drafted by the Jets, of course, I grew up in New York. I was like, no, please, <laughs> no. Can't he fall to three and play for the Niners? But, yeah. but the fact that you were playing baseball, that paved the way for you to be at one of those teams that you wanted to be, right? I think so. I think, you know, Red had multiple picks. I mean, Charles Bradley was a big player in our conference that year and was a great player, but he was the first-round pick. Uh, Tracy Jackson was a 6'6 wing player, also drafted in the first round by the Celtics ahead of me that same year. And then they, by the time they got to the second round in the 31st pick, I think, um, you know, it was a no-brainer for Red. He had a stacked team, a, a championship-level team, and other draft picks. So it wasn't near as big a risk for him as it was for other teams. So that was a, that was a, a blessing. Yeah. So before all that happens, you're, you're playing for the Blue Jays in the summer and you're playing for the Cougars in the winter. And, and we mentioned all the superstars on campus at that time. So how did you meet your wife, Michelle? Um, you know, I got to BYU um, a few weeks early, maybe even a month early, and was here playing pickup games and working out and getting in shape, trying to get used to the altitude. Uh, and um, I dated a handful of times. You know, there were dances before school started. Yeah. And I met a lot of people. Um, and I met Michelle the first day of class. And um, we talked, but I didn't really – we didn't date for – a month and a half or so after we first met but once we dated then we were we dated for the next two years but what was the conversation like when you when you tried to convince her that to provide a living for her and your future family you wanted to play sports um yeah she had no idea who i was at first or that i was playing had a baseball contract or playing for the byu basketball team even uh, it, was, it was much before that and um so we just hit it off. I mean, she saw, did see me play intramural football. I wasn't supposed to be playing, but I was hey, playing. Danny I, I used still to play, say that he used to play softball when he wasn't supposed to be playing too, right? I, I, I tell her that she fell in love with me watching me play quarterback uh, on, intramural, on the it was? intramural football field. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. And is she um, like Brenda's wife? Brent Blaine's wife's into sports. My wife could care less about sports. Where's Michelle on the sports? Spectrum. Um, I, you know, she may be one of the most competitive people I've been around. Um, she's, yeah, she's a competitor. I mean, she plays mostly tennis and yeah. pickleball now, and but she played softball in high school, and uh, she's into sports. So and, she got what you were going Toulson, through. So like, she's yeah. related to all the tools. Yeah, she she comes from a real career. sports. Family. So yeah. Brenda and Michelle play tennis together, and uh, and I asked Brenda when they started to play when you guys moved back out, and. Uh, I said, How, how's Michelle? And, and Brenda goes, her exact words, oh, she's intense. It's awesome. Because Brenda's in, you know, pretty intense, too. Like, Brenda really likes to win. She goes, she's intense. It's awesome. And I'm like, she's married to Danny. That doesn't surprise me at all, right? <laughs> no, it's her. It's the other way around. She's, <laughs> she's intense. And, like, my kids are intense, and mostly because of her. Describe the feeling of your first Major League home run with the Blue Jays, which was June 2nd. 1979, and compare that joy to your first Little League home run. Oh, wow. Um, I mean, hitting a home run in the major leagues is, is fun. Uh, it was in Seattle, so it was northwest. I had a lot of family and friends that were, you know, growing up in Oregon were, that were there at the game. Um, so that was, that was fun. Um, I, I think still the highlights of baseball were just, you know, playing in Yankee Stadium and playing yeah. in Fenway Park. I mean, those were just playing against Reggie Jackson and Billy Martin coaching third base and managing the team and Thurman Munson and talking to me as I walked <laughs> to the plate, you know, it's, uh, th those were, those were very special. Those might've been more exciting and fulfilling dreams than, you know, playing in the NBA finals in, against the Lakers in the forum, um, you know, playing in those at such a young age in those ballparks was amazing. Do you remember your first little league home run or have you had too many big shots since? Uh, I don't remember my first one. I, I, I remember my first one. Um, I don't remember what age I was, but I remember, you know, it's inside the park. You just hit it in that. <laughs> and you just, 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 just run. <laughs> yeah, just run. I, I was always pretty fast. So, like, I made a home run more often than I probably deserve. I didn't hit it very far, but <laughs> hit it in the right spot. Well, your home run with the Blue Jays, it lasted for 40 years as the youngest player to hit a home run in Toronto history until Vladimir Guerrero hit one in 2019. So for 40 years, it that's was quite, that's quite an amazing thing. Yeah. I think I hit two and I, it took him, it took him maybe two weeks to hit two. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably right. the same or age. two at bats yeah. for Guerrero. Right. But you, you're comp- you're very accomplished in a lot of sports. You're you're a tremendous golfer as well. Um, and so Dave and I were thinking it would be fun to to know your opinion. What's the most difficult thing to do? Is it hitting a baseball thrown by a major league pitcher? Uh, taking it coast to coast in a college game and making a last second shot against Notre Dame, hitting a three point basket against the Lakers in the NBA Finals, or hitting a golf ball out of a bunker at Riverside when lunch is on the line. Which is oh. the? I mean, I think hitting a major league slider and sinker are the are the toughest when you play against a player such as Jack Morris. Oh yeah, like maybe the best pitcher in the nineties. Uh, you know, hitting a Nolan Ryan fastball of over hundred miles an hour. I mean, those are. Those are challenging, but uh, I think the sinker and slider from Jack Morris might have been the been most the toughest, the guy. most difficult yeah. task of all of all sports, I would think. Not hitting a bunker, a ball out of the bunker to beat Santiago for lunch. No, that's or Fino I mean, or any of those guys. I don't even have to hit it that close to beat Santiago. <laughs> I just da- got to get it somewhere on the green. Dave and I, uh, Go- Governor Herbert's been a really great golf partner for Dave and I, and I love playing with the governor because when you hit a bad one, he just goes. Uh, Blaine, governor's pardon, pardon, just go again. I'm like, and then his secret service would help us find our balls. They would find the balls. And, then, and I would say, governor, not, you're not the governor anymore. You, you, you know, you retired, so that doesn't work. He goes, oh, no. Governor's pardons work, like, even when you're when you're out of office. So he's the best to play with. You, no yeah. bad shots. I, I play a lot with Santiago. I think he just takes, takes a, <laughs> a governor's pardon on his own. I think, and, now, and that's exactly illegal. Was. He can't do that, but I'm sure he does. Who, who's, who's the best? Because I know you've played a lot of – golf who's the best uh, professional athlete you've played with that's not a professional golfer um, at golf hmm. um, Steph Curry so Steph's a really good player huh yeah he's he's very good yeah we see him on those celebrity tours every now and yeah. then yeah his, his dad is very good too Steph's a little better I think so did he grow up Del he grew up playing then yeah. Steph did used to play with Michael a lot with Michael Jordan played a lot with Michael Michael's a very competitive guy has an amazing short game Plays so much golf. Plays at his own course, I think, 200, 250 rounds a year. And then on the other end of the spectrum is like, and I haven't played with Charles, but 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 Charles Barkley was right in front of me at the TPC at Summerlin one time, and I watched him play. It almost made me play bad. <laughs> I, know, I, I almost got a hitch in my swing. It was when he was really struggling with that. He would start his downswing and stop. I don't know if he's still doing that. I hope it's fixed because it was painful. Yeah, Charles and I played a lot of golf when we, we played together for three years in Phoenix. And uh, with Dan Marley, we, we played a lot of golf. And um, Charles was pretty good. I mean, he shot in the 80s most of the time. I remember one game, one day we were playing, and he had to par 18 to shoot 78. And then when he went to Lake Tahoe in mm-hmm. the celebrity tournament, which was, you know, putt everything, every shot matters, uh, you know, television cameras everywhere. And, of course, Charles is going to attract a lot of attention. And I think that got him. And he wow. was hitting balls at the end of that round. And it was like he had a little bit of the yips. And it just got worse. And he tried everything to fix it. And including, I was told, I didn't see this, that he, he got a set of left-handed clubs for like a year. And was trying to that. go lefty. Trying to go lefty. But he is back playing. And uh, he's ch- made a challenge. And so we got to get together and play. <laughs> oh, he said, that'd he be said fun. he's ready for me. And he's back. To oh, yeah, that's I awesome. Yeah, I had heard that he was a decent player before – the travesty that I saw out. I've never heard that he was a decent player. Like everybody has potential. No, no. I I I heard, I mean, I used to say to him, you're like one of the best athletes I've ever seen to be able to hit a ball as you stop your (laughs) downswing. Yeah. (laughs) And like you still make contact. (laughs) That's it. That is something. BYU Hall of Famer, Danny Ainge, who's also a three-time NBA world champion and current CEO of the Utah Jazz on the Wise Guys tonight. Let's go back to your first practice at Boston in November 1982, following a court battle with the Blue Jays and the Celtics, which the Celtics win, so you can leave baseball and join the roster. You walk into the gym. There's Larry Bird, Robert Parrish, and Kevin McHale. What happened next? Um, there's also Cedric Maxwell. Yeah, there's the rest yeah, of the team. Yeah. Some, some other really good players. Um, we scrimmaged that day. Really the only thing I remember about that day, because uh, I practiced. The team had been on the road, and I practiced for a few days on my own. Um, well, with ML Carr, ML Carr was working with me on teaching me some things, but we scrimmaged that day. And the thing I remember the most clearly is Cedric Maxwell sitting on the stage by the by our court and counting out my shots, like three for 11, <laughs> four for 14, you know, five for 16. Because you came in highly touted. Yeah, I came in highly touted. That's and, you brutal. Know, we had a really good team, and, and uh, it was funny because the, the coach was Bill Fitch at that on that day, and 
And uh, he came over and, you know, I, I didn't shoot the ball well, but he came over to me and said, you know, it's not as easy as you thought, is it? You know, and like, and my first thought was, like, those are the easiest shots I've ever got in a game. <laughs> I could get a shot anytime I wanted, um, but I just didn't make them. And, uh, you know, shooting the ball that year, because I came in the middle of a season of a really good team, and so I wasn't playing very much, and I shot the ball miserably that year. I remember Cedric was working with me one day at a game in New Jersey, and and uh, you know I was shooting the ball pretty well before the game, and I came in. I, I didn't even know if I'd play that night, and I came in the game, and my first shot hit the side of the backboard from the baseline. <laughs> he just went. Oh, I could just see him on the sideline <laughs> going. I'm just wasting my time. Well, we were the McCanns were all in because you were there, uh, and I remember no one waved a towel better than ML Carr uh, when when he needed to get the crowd going. But was there ever a time? When you're out there with Larry, when you said, hey, Larry, how about getting me the ball? <laughs> no, that didn't happen. Not one time? <laughs> I, I remember I remember just to put in perspective, I remember I'm coming off of screens, and, you know, like I said, I could get shots, you know, with those guys setting screens yeah. when I wanted. And uh, the coach pulls me aside, Bill Fitch, and he says, okay, like, what do, you, what do you expect to make on that shot? I go, I don't know, 52% I'm going to make on those turnouts. And, He's going like, what does he shoot? Points to Larry. I go, yeah, 60. He goes, what does he shoot? And he points to Mikhail. He goes, 60. <laughs> and it's like, uh, do you get my point? <laughs> like, we don't need 52% shots, uh, you know, coming, wow. off, coming off of down screens. And so, like, it just kind of, it changed me, but it, it, it was right. You yeah. know, if you're going to try to win, you know, like, those guys are just so special. They have to have the ball. You know, I see the game now, and it's completely different. And I saw throughout my I remember we had a kid named Connor Henry who showed up maybe three years after this incident. He mm -hmm. came in for a 10-day contract out of the G League, and he doesn't know any better, right? He's coming off screen. He's got his one crack at the NBA, and he's making all these shots. And I'm going, like, how? why is someone not saying it to him? Like, he's <laughs> can't, like, shooting those shots. But, um, you know, there's part of it that, um, you know, winning is what it's all about. And, um, you know, changing your game to win and conform to what's best for your team. Uh, I did I did have a good time. You know, I think I scored probably my 10 highest scoring games of my career were when Bird didn't play or McHale or oh, both yeah. of them didn't play. And so we used to have shoot around and, like, auction off or or bet on those shots. Like, I get 10 of Larry's shots tonight. If I make <laughs> oh, his shot. Larry's not I get playing three of his shot, McHale's <laughs> shots. And so... That was uh, – th 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 those were fun games. But, um, you know, playing with those guys, obviously we won a couple championships, went to the finals four years in a row, and yeah. and those guys were a dream to play with. How, how long uh, were you there? Now you're face-to-face you're -face with you're playing, you're a teammate, before you – and was there a moment where you're just about Larry Bird? Whoa, this dude is really special and he's different than all the rest. And did that moment – or did you already know that before you got there? Yeah, I knew it before I got there, but there are moments when you're there and up close and personal and you see everything that about, about him, his work ethic. And, um, you know, the thing that stands out is his confidence. You know, I always consider myself a confident player, but, you know, Larry was an entirely different level. Uh, I mean, there's so many stories I have about just him taking games over and you know, we coach you call a play, and, like, he's not running the play. Like, it's just, <laughs> okay, he's just going to take it and score. Like, but he just had so much belief in himself, and he could get a shot, uh, you know, with double teams at the end of games. Like, teams knew what we were running, and they'd still, like, he'd still get a quality look off it at being 6'10 and, and being able to shoot the way he did. So how did you ever take the floor in the NBA Finals against the Lakers, and you look down there and it's magic, and, Kareem and, and their group, and you've got your group, and you're in it. You're part of this thing. Yeah. I mean, it was fun. It was, it was very special. I mean, those teams were stacked, both the Lakers and the Celtics in that, in that early to mid-'80s. Um, you know, Kareem, uh, you know, arguably one of the greatest players that's ever lived, and you got Bird and Magic who, you know, changed, transformed the entire league. And then you got players like Worthy and Byron Scott and – Bob McAdoo and McHale and Maxwell. And, I mean, we got a guy. Scott, Rambus we, we was in a, there at some a, point. Yeah, but I didn't mention him on purpose. But <laughs> we, have, we have a guy like Scott Wedman, who was the highest paid player during this era at one point and was an NBA All-Star the year before we got him. And he couldn't even get on the court. I mean, he was like a 
10 minute a game player and was a fantastic player but big three point shooter he's right playing, yeah. yeah playing behind bird and and Mikhail. but most people don't even know like he was an all star it's 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 interesting we we were talking about this with BYU in the Gonzaga game the other day um, there's guys making shots all game long and then the game's on the line and it's coming down the stretch and there were times we looked out of the floor and we're going no nobody even wants it right now like nobody even wants the ball and you you were a guy that wanted the ball and and when you got with the Celtics and you're surrounded by a bunch of other guys that that wanted the ball um, you had to play a role uh, but it didn't mean that if, if they drew something up for you you weren't like yeah give me the ball I'll knock down that shot what's the difference between a player that wants the ball in the third quarter um, and wants to make shots, but but doesn't necessarily want it in the last six seconds of the ball game when the game's on the line. Yeah, I, you know, I think that I think that as I look at those Celtics and Lakers teams, I think you know when you have a Byron Scott and a James Worthy and Dennis Johnson and Cedric Max, like those guys were all capable. They had been go-to guys throughout their high school, throughout their college careers, and none of them were afraid in the NBA because they had moments already. They had moments where. I mean, even though they're not going to run a play for me with Bird or McHale out on the court, like if they're going to double my guy or like we have, I have to be prepared to take that shot. Right. And you, you're not afraid just because you've lived it and you've had that success. And I think you have that confidence and belief in yourself. And, and I think that like with BYU's team, they don't really have a guy that has been that person ever in their life. Maybe not even in high school, but probably, yeah. but um, for sure not in, in college level yet. So I don't think they're afraid of it. I think that what happens is um, you gain confidence as your career goes along. And I think also there's, a, there's a, such a tendency for people to play not to lose mm. and just to take their foot off the gas. And they're thinking like, you know, we got to hang on to this game. It's, you know, we got a 10-point lead and the game slows down. And so I don't think it's afraid to shoot. Um, I think it's just sometimes not knowing – how aggressive to be and how confident to play and how much swagger to have than, uh, you know, the, the constant movement. You're trying to run the clock or do you, you know, do you, can you run the clock and still try to get the best shot at the same time? And the good teams can do that. That describes the mentality of getting the ball with five, six seconds left in the NCAA tournament, and there's no way you were going to pass it. You are going to the hoop to beat Notre Dame. There wasn't time to pass it, but I have a feeling that it didn't cross your mind. It was just, I've just got to go score. No, you know, actually, I, I really did because they had played a box and one on me the whole game, and I thought for sure they were going to trap me it's somewhere along the court, along the way I could get across half court. But my intention was to get the ball up the court as fast as I could and – I was going to have to pass. Really? And, you know, they just, you know, because they spread out their defense, I was able to weave the way in and get by them. But I was anticipating having to hit Balaf or, you know, he had hit the shot before or Steve Craig. I mean, somebody need, was going to need to make a shot was really what was in my mind at that point. So as you're moving through the lane, uh, and I think Orlando Woolridge is moving over there and Trapuca is somewhere on the, on the floor, it's at this point you're just going, hey, the – they're not coming over here, and now now I'm right at the rim? Oh, yeah. No, I was just pushing it up the court, and it just – they never stopped me. And so I just went all the way, and it just happened. And, but, and we should say, though, I mean, I, and I, I know this from, from that team, if you got double teamed, you had every confidence that whoever you hit – with that pass was going to knock down that shot. Not really. Not no? In that, not in that game. <laughs> no. No, huh? we weren't making very many shots in that game. It was a UCLA game. Yeah, that's was going, true. Everything that's was going. true. But we came, we came back. I mean, that game was like crazy because we came back from 13 down. We actually had no business winning that game, and they slowed the game way down. But there again, Notre Dame had like six or seven. I just mentioned Tracy Jackson and John Paxson and Joe yes. Klein and Waldridge and Trapuca. Like these guys, this team was stacked. Yeah. And – um I mean, we had no business. Kite and Roberts had four fouls, and they got a 13-point lead. And I remember Frank Arnold saying, "We they're, they're letting us stay in this game. Like, they're letting us – because we couldn't guard them if they would have stayed aggressive. But they tried to slow the game down, and they allowed us back in the game. And uh, we were very fortunate to win that game, obviously. Danny Ainge on the Wise Guys tonight. You can join us on YouTube, Facebook, Twitch. Send us a question, ysguys.com. We appreciate having you all with us in our time with, with Danny. Brian Santiago is coming up here in just yes, a little bit. Brian Santiago in the we'll house. We'll dive into some Big 12 and, and all that stuff. Plus, we got some golf questions for, for Santiago. We already had a golf answer or two from Danny. Yep, uh, yep. Um, one last golf question about Michael Jordan because you were in his special 
uh, that um, yeah, the was it thirty for thirty? Well, it's just an ESPN. Special. Yeah, whatever it was was really good. Yeah. Um, what was it like guarding him when when you see all the assignments are different and now you got twenty three, and then uh, what meant more beating the Bulls on the Celtics or beating Jordan by yourself on the golf course? Oh, I mean, you know. Um, you know, he was obviously he's not the same kind of golfer. So like beating him on the golf course is fun and exciting, and he's good. I respect his game. But you but, were better. But I was. I think I was a little better. But <laughs> beating him on the basketball court, where you know he's not better. I mean, Michael Jordan. The one thing about him that you can't ever deny is his entire career, every playoff series, even in '86 when we had this stacked team, we beat them in three straight games in the in the playoffs in the first round. But he was clearly the best player. Didn't he have 66 in one of those games? 60-something. Something like that, that was one of something. the most fun games. I remember that game because down the stretch, he and Larry were just ch- trading shots. Yeah. It was nuts. Yeah, no, he was you know, he was so special. But even then, he was the best player. And then throughout the rest of his career, as he started winning championships and you know, he got a little better team around him, yeah. there was never a doubt at the end of any series that he was ever in who the best player in the world was. It was Michael Jordan. And, you know, I don't know who else that's been. I don't know what other player even yeah. comes close to, you know, being undefeated and being the best player in a playoff series every year. Did you enjoy your moments when you had to guard him as the ultimate yeah, challenge? Yeah. Uh, the ultimate challenge. And if you did stop him, it was, you know, a miracle. And if you didn't, like, so what? Nobody guards him. And But I, re- I remember a funny time in this 63-point game. And, was, <laughs> and uh I got accused of doing this a little bit more than the coaches or my teammates would have liked, but um, Walton fouls out guarding Jordan in an ISO, and he's screaming and cursing me out, like, quit switching. (laughs) (laughs) Guard your own man. This is Walton yelling at you. Yelling you for switching switching with him. I go, hey, I just want you to be able to appreciate how hard it is. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> get hey, when, when you listen as an old teammate of Bill Walton, do you ever listen to him do a college basketball I, game? I turn on the games just to watch him. It's like, like back, back east. That's the only reason I'm awake is watching Bill Walton. You turn him on, and I'm just like, on. my wife's like, why are you watching these two teams? And I go, I just have to hear what comes out of his mouth because yeah. it, 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 it's just where he goes in a basketball game is like no was other. He, was he like that in the locker room? Yes. Just the same? He's a character. Just, I mean, he makes me laugh all the time. I mean... <laughs> I remember one time, and, you know, he used to stutter even when yeah. he was playing with the Celtics. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we'd tease him about it because he was, you know, he was a tease and a practical joker. But I remember one time he um, was yelling at Jerry Seasting, and uh, he was running down the court, and Seasting was guarding the ball, and he was in the Walton's way as he's trying to sprint back on defense. And he, he looks at Jerry Seasting, and he goes, the only thing I hate worse than guards is backup guards. <laughs> <laughs> but he was he was such a character. Uh, he made us laugh every day. He reinvents the English language in just about every yeah. broadcast. We're like, I'm I'm not sure what. Oh, I just got. You have to listen. You almost have to listen to him like you have to listen to to uh, the late elder Neil A. Maxwell in a talk because you're just like, if I blink, I'm 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 off. What, yeah. What you stay with him throughout. You gotta be, you gotta and stay at the end, it. you hope it makes sense. Well, and I, and I love like he'll take you down pathways. Like he'll go study history of the university there, and he'll throw some stuff out there and bring it all together, and then mix it with American history. And I'm just like, I, okay. I just got a history lesson. I'm watching North Carolina and Duke, but I just got a history lesson. <laughs> Most but, I think, of it. but I think people miss some of the funny things he says oh. about the game. Oh, yeah. Because he's doing all this other off-topic things of a basketball <laughs> game, and he's, like, talking about how like how, how bad the refs are. Like, yeah. they're ruining oh, yeah. the game of basketball. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that the Pac-12 is the conference of champions no yeah. matter what. Yeah. Oh. Uh, is there uh, – if there's ever an injustice in your life, it would probably be that some people still think that you bit Tree Rollins during that skirmish when everybody knows that Tree is the one that bit you. I think there was just a tweet out there today. Someone at work showed me that today. They go, is today the anniversary of oh, you no. biting Tree, of Tree Rollins? Biting? I go, no, no, no. But there was a tweet, something about. Really? He goes, the only reason I'm sending this tweet is just to clarify that Danny got bit by yeah. Tree Rollins. and. I remember the headlines the next day in the Boston paper, and it said, Tree Bites Man. I remember it, yep. Yeah, yep. so. you gotten a few skirmishes over the years. When you when you look back, was there one where, that you got in where you go, I shouldn't have got in this one. This is a 
this is one where I need my teammates to get me out of it? Not really. I mean, I felt like they were all worthy. I mean, I, I shouldn't have got into them because, I, you know, I might have been like, one in six and <laughs> in the fight card after the after the ones that got in but the tree one was funny because uh i was feeling bad about it but he was cheap jotting and you know he's a great guy and everybody that played with him loved tree so i'm not bashing tree but you know it's just that kind of a game it's a big playoff game and he knocks out quinn buckner before he hit in, in the game yeah before i came back in the game so he had he was getting us like with, mm-hmm. with elbows and, and fouls and so when he got me running down the court and hit me with that elbow, um, like I felt like I had to do something. I had to like run or like go tackle him. You were and, smart because you went right for his knees. Yeah. And by the way, like we should have used, like BYU's football team should use that tackle yeah. video. Yes. Like it's this classic. is how it's you a, it's tackle. It's how you bring video. down a yeah, beast. It's a teaching video. Yeah, that was like, good fundamentals. <laughs> it was good. It was excellent. Head then, up. He saw what he hit. It was yeah. all, it, we should make a video of it. It was yeah. interesting, too, because I watched it the other day. You're in this pile, and you're, I think, down at the bottom with Tree. And the next thing you know, Larry Bird's rolling in there. I'm not even sure what he was doing, but but you had, your teammates had had your back. They were all in on that. Yeah, so, I, you know, there was a there was a fight earlier, and it was uh, the, the Dr. J, Larry Bird fight. So, Doc, Larry was talking trash to Dr. J, which he didn't usually do. Talk to his, you know, the stars of the game. I didn't know anyone talked trash to Dr. Yeah. J. And, uh, but Larry said, I think Larry had like 35 halfway through the third quarter and t- said to Dr. J, you know, like, you need to retire, bro. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think Dr. J took that too well. And he's like the nicest guy in the world. But they got in this fight. And there was, and, but we're watching film of that fight. And um, one of our teammates wasn't involved in that fight and bird was visibly dis- upset really at that moment. That he didn't yeah. come to his that, that other that one of our teammates one of our regular players wasn't in the the, the mix and that, that really s- did not settle with him but yeah he was always going to be there if there was a fight it, going on he's going to be there to defend is that players. like now there's all these rules around it back i always say back in the day but back when you were playing back um if if you didn't go to defend your if your teammate got in a fight like you had to go defend him yeah it was, and yeah. and now the rules in college and the NBA if you leave the bench you're done and so yeah can't leave the bench if you're on the court you can go try to break it up but yeah yeah it's it's just it's not the same it's not the good old days they can't just duke it out like the good old days but I was I, mad I was mad do you remember I don't know if you watched this Danny Brian will remember it for sure but when Zach Wilson just got mugged at Coastal Carolina. For no reason, like the play's over yeah, and yeah, just two took dudes, him down, like two dudes, and they're yeah. throwing him down and doing all that. I was visibly angry that the entire team didn't run out and beat the crap out yeah, of. Yeah, the two ref guys. was watching it. The ref just let it go, but I was I was mad that the team, because I have this old school mentality, like the why was the entire offensive line not down there beating the crap out of those well, two guys? Well, the, I agree with you, but what about the the late hit penalty on the quarter, roughing the passer this week? They, Oh, the guy just barely got tackled. Yeah, what's he, a what's he, a tackle he anymore? He didn't even swing him down. No, it was unbelievable. Like, yeah, that was a huge play. But yeah, the the game they're getting soft. Yeah, it's sure. it's but not it's not. I like was gonna I was gonna say on that on that Tree Rollins thing. What happened was I got in this fight with Tree Rollins. I you know wasn't happy that I got in this fight, but I was feeling a little down. That was on a Sunday afternoon televised game, and so I get a phone call the next day from Marvin J. Ashton who was close to us. I mean, he married Michelle and I in Salt Lake Temple. And yeah. and he says, he goes, you know, the brother and I talked about your incident yesterday in the game. And he said, uh, the only thing we would have done different is we would have gone after him a lot sooner than you did. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That sounds like something Elder, Elder Perry would say as well. There, yeah. there were some guys that were yeah, in the we, sports. We were, we were That's ta- awesome. When Devin was on, we were talking about um, a play where Elder Perry, Devin had gone to the bucket finished at the rim and then turned around run back and i think they're playing notre dame at byu and the guy forward him right right in the face and knocked him to the ground almost knocked him out and uh the cameras kind of went over because coach was up now and um then there's large man stood up in the front row and leaned over and you could see in his lips he said what's wrong with you ref are you blind (laughs) and then um a woman's hand came up on his shoulder and sat him down out of the picture and then we, we asked him about it later, and he goes, yeah, that was me. And my wife told me that was not, you know, 
That's not how I should conduct myself. So I've got to do way, way better. I, I, have, to, I have to do that with President Santiago. A lot. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes. Steve Cleveland yes. sent us a, a note of an incident we're oh, going to talk yes. about. Oh, yes. We might have to bring that on, up. On the bench. For um, back in, in your time in Boston, you were also serving as a bishop in your ward. And, um, and we were kicking it back and forth, fascinated, because we've, we've all been in these kind of scenarios. And I was thinking how the young men responded to an interview with you as the bishop who's also running the beloved franchise in the area. Did you find that they were on time more, that they listened to you more, that they did what you said? Uh, we had great young men. It was like, yeah, they were the easy part of the bishoping part. Really? Yeah, the, the, the priest quorum and the young men, they were the easy part. Yeah, but I was surrounded by great, great people. As You know, like that's the only way you can get through those callings, especially when you have a busy life. But yeah. that was a great experience, yeah. That had to have been a, your street cred in the, amongst the youth in the ward had to be skyrocketing because we, we see it all the time with different types. But but someone who's running the the beloved team as they're winning championships, I just think that the youth would think that was pretty cool. Uh, they might have thought of, but you know, I think they were just I was just a normal bishop to them, most of them. Yeah. D- Danny and I were talking the other night about. Um, uh, he was telling me about this great idea, and we won't get all into it. But I said we should start a not for profit to help these kids. And Danny's like, Blaine, we're old. Kids don't listen to us anymore. <laughs> I was like, come on, man. I don't feel like we're that old. They, but. they still listen, but yeah. you're right. It might take like nine times. Yeah. Hey, hey, I wanted to talk. As you know, your career wound down, phenomenal playing career. Um, one, one of the all-time greats, um, clearly one of the all-time greats in, in BYU history, if not the greatest player that ever played uh, here. Um, and then then it's into coaching and then into management. And in in the roles that you've played as an executive, you have to make a lot of tough decisions. And we were, we were noting that you traded Paul Pierce and Kevin Garnett away from the Celtics last summer. You traded Donovan Mitchell and Rudy Gobert away. Um, despite what the general public thinks, you know, they're all screaming and, you know, second guessing. Both trades designed to make your teams better. H- how did you learn to have that toughness in this role where you can kind of just focus and not worry about the, what the public says and do what's best for the team and make those tough calls? You know, I've just been um, scrutinized as a player for so many years. Like, it's like the, I have pretty thick skin. Um, I don't know if I always had thick skin, but I certainly developed thick skin. But trading away good players is, is always hard. Um, but it's not because of the media scrutiny. It's hard because the relationships that you develop with the people. So with Paul and KG, it was um, – you know, it wasn't as hard because they were older and they were going together. Mm. And, um, you know, they had a chance to win probably more than our team was going to have a chance to win that year. So I had to convince KG. He renegotiated his contract with Brooklyn, and I think he was all in. Once once that all, all settled in. But uh, it wasn't easy, but it was for easy to do because it was a no-brainer choice for our franchise. And that actually goes back to I remember one year I was with – Red are back at a Christmas dinner, and McHale and Bird were there, and they were both injured. And this was like 1988, and uh, Christmas of 88, and sitting around the table, and I go, Red, are you telling me you could get Detlef Shrimp and Sam Perkins and Dale Ellis for Kevin McHale right now? And these guys were all young mm-hmm. players in the league. And he goes, yeah, I probably could. And I go, and you're not doing it? And Kevin was sitting right here. Kevin's one of my best friends <laughs> even to this day. And I go, Are you, and you could get Chuck Person and, and uh, Herb <coughs> Williams and Steve Stoponovich for Larry Bird right now? He go, he's got two Achilles tendon surgeries. Like, mm-hmm. uh, why are we not doing that? And I thought, like, we could restack the whole team. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I always wondered about that. But, yeah, like, you know, it wasn't the first time I had trade discussions about Paul and KG, but there was nothing tempting Ever, I was going to let them retire as Celtics, and yeah. mm-hmm. and it, it go. But when Brooklyn came along, it was like an absolute no-brainer. Something that I had to convince people like this is what we have to do. Even Paul and KG, Donovan and Rudy was different because I'm coming into a new organization. This is not me. I'm just a, a chain link for Ryan. I'm like to look at the blind spots that they may have as they're making these decisions. As you know, without Dennis Lindsay, it was such a prominent and really good general manager for so many years that I'm just a link in the chain of the decision-making process trying to, and I'm just helping make that decision. But it was unanimous decisions of 
these were things for the, all the different various reasons that we had that it wasn't me coming in and going, we got to do this. We gotta yeah. get, you know, mm -hmm. I watched Donovan since he was 16. Like, I don't want to trade Donovan Mitchell. Yeah. But look what you got for him. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was good, but like, you know, guys like Donovan are hard to find. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we're very fortunate that Lowry's turned out to be really good. Colin has, has played really well for us. And, you know, we got, we got some assets to try to continue to build. When you have those kind of assets, and we asked Jimmer if he had a question for you uh, when he was with us last week. He said, you asked Danny what he's going to do with the Jazz the, the rest of the <laughs> season. But when you have those assets over the next handful of years, you really have an opportunity to, to do so many different things. Um, and most teams don't have the freedom that you created in a short period of time? Well, yeah, I mean, coming to the Jazz just a little over a year ago, uh, they didn't really have any. They had, had sold out and were trying to win, and, 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 and I can't say that that was a wrong decision, but um, they didn't have any assets, really, to trade. Um, and so I asked all the guys as we're sitting there on draft day, I go, is this fun? You know, you got all these no, different no players. Picks, again, right? No picks, right? No picks, no really <laughs> no, opportunities to do anything. And then free agency came along a week later, and I go, like, are we having fun yet? You know, we're over the tax. We don't have any. And, we, and you know, you, you can't get into the repeater tax unless you have, a you know, a championship caliber team. So, um, you know, it was – these were discussions and conversations I was having as I was getting to know uh, the – the jazz front office who are a lot of great people that Dennis and Quinn hired and I'd be stupid to get rid of them. And they're, they're outstanding people. So it's been fun getting to know them. Well, it's going to be fun to watch what, because with assets, that's how you, you build a franchise and get competitive. And, and I know your ultimate goal and I know Ryan's is as well to win a world championship. Is sure. that possible here? Sure. Yeah. I wouldn't be here if I didn't think it was possible. It's, it's hard to win it anywhere. Mm -hmm. winning in the NBA is, is challenging. Winning playoff series is hard. Uh, but, yeah, winning is going to be difficult for sure. Speaking of difficult winning, BYU goes to the Big 12 next year, and uh, you've evaluated talent for a long time. As you evaluate the Big 12, in what areas does BYU have to get better just to compete? So I think BYU can compete. Even even with the t team they have now, it's just a matter of consistency. Um you know, I think that Big 12, you just don't have a day off. Yeah. You know, you don't lose to Gonzaga by one point, one night. And get then, Pepperdine. And get Pepperdine the next night. You, you know, you got Iowa State and you got TCU and you got Houston. And, I mean, it doesn't end. And the, and the Big 12 is the best basketball conference in basketball right now for sure. Yeah. It'll be fun, but you're right. It'll be – I don't know if the fans are ready. I think the fans are going to be exhausted through next season if they have to bring it every night because they're good about selling out the place for Gonzaga and St. Yeah. Mary's, and the others are well. We'll go to the game if we if we have I, time. I think that's going to be bring an excitement though. You know, yeah. like you you know the, the you got to look at it different. I mean, the WCC is completely different than the Big Twelve, and there will be an adjustment period. But I mean, it all depends on the, on the talent that you get. And um, but I think Mark Pope has done a good job with the with the team and. Uh, guys compete at a very high level. I thought that the Creighton game was, you know, except for the last minute and a half or two minutes, was unbelievable performance. The Utah performance was great. Gonzaga yeah. the other night was amazing until just the very end. And, you know, it took them to make a couple of great shots in transition to beat us. But um, I think it was – I think it's fun watching the team play. And so if you got more Gonzagas and more St. Mary's and, and that's what we're going to have in the Big 12, I think it's going to – we're, you know, it's going to train our team and, and the organization and our fans and everybody to like be ready. You got to play. You got to be ready to play every night. Last question for you before Blaine hits you up with five quick ones. Uh, when you look back over your life uh, and you remember UCLA telling you you weren't fast enough to, to be with the Bruins, which leads you to BYU, and then everything that's happened to you since that, um, with with your personal life and your career and. And all leading up to tonight, can when you see the stars of how your life's been connected from one thing to another, can can you doubt a, a, a higher power that said, "Danny, this is your course"? Oh, I've never doubted that. Like it was, uh, I, I wasn't planning on going to BYU. It was uh, Marvin J. Ashton had come to my home uh, or come to our stake, and I had, had requested a meeting with me. And he, as you guys know, he was a big U of U guy. And U of U was recruiting me at the time as well. And, um, but anyway, he said to me, he says, if you uh, are worthy, 
you know, going to BYU, you should at least look into it. I'm not going to tell you where you should go to school, but yeah. you should at least make a visit there. And so I probably wouldn't have made the visit had he not brought really? that up. My brother had come to BYU, didn't work out. I, I had some um, experience at BYU, but not much. Um, but yeah, I was I was all about the Pac-8 in those days, and it was big time basketball. Oregon, Oregon State, where powerhouses. Washington was a national powerhouse, and um, but UCLA yeah, my, was UCLA. But my my re, my experience on a recruiting trip um, at BYU changed my whole life. What happened? Uh, uh, you know, so we were first of all, so Scott Rooney and Greg Anderson were the guys that were taking me out. And I think the first thing we did was we went to a movie, and Mark Handy was a senior, and he had played with my brother, um, but he got in a, a snowball fight with a couple of guys that were throwing snowballs at his truck, and so that was fun. <laughs> and then we went over. To, then we went over. Welcome to, the, to Provo. Yeah, exactly. then, then we went over to the dorms, and uh, I met Alan Taylor, who was a, a year ahead of us. He was Scott Runia's age and uh, Greg Anderson's age, and he was. On probation, uh, you know, for because he threw a kid out the second floor of his dorm window. That was frowned it. upon. Yeah. And I said, uh, like, why did you do that? And he said, the kid, you know, got my homework wet. <laughs> and I go, okay, that All justifies right. that. <laughs> <laughs> and so then, so this fight, and then I meet Alan Taylor. Who's and this is how your center, visit's going. And this is like, those are guys I want to play with. <laughs> these are regular dudes. Yeah, I like these guys. Yeah, regular dudes. And so, um, and then we went home and... Um, and Scott Rooney and Greg and Greg Anderson, they had um, borrowed uh, like four snowmobiles, and we were going to Strawberry Reservoir the next morning. And a big snowstorm came that night, and they called the campus police on themselves as they got in their snowmobiles and were riding around campus trying to ditch the campus cops. No kidding, <laughs> it was hilarious. I go, these are my kind of people. <laughs> I'm gonna <laughs> anyway. That anyway. So the next day we went on a on a snowmobile trip and uh, we were racing across Strawberry and I went off of a ten foot cliff and the handlebar went right into my chest, hit me in the face. I fell down, was unconscious. Blood was coming out of my head and you know the guys were up top. They go like they thought I was dead, <laughs> laying on <laughs> laying on the ground in the snow. And they anyway they ended up taking me and I had stitches put in above my eye and uh, and that night. After I got back, got stitches, and made sure I was okay. Um, probably had a concussion. But anyway, that night was a baptism of Mike May. Okay. And um, I think that baptism probably touched me more than, than anything in my life up to that point, for sure. And uh, by the time I got home from that visit, just all of the experiences, but the coaches, the campus, the professors, the players, uh, I had never really been around you know, other LDS kids that were like them. And um, they were just a lot more normal like me from what, you know, my experience had been. So anyway, I was, I was very excited to go play there. And, and of course, 22,000 people in the Marriott Center doesn't hurt. It's a great environment. It was a great environment when Danny was playing. Believe me, I was sitting up there watching it. Did you hit any jumps over by the Smoot building on your snowmobile or any of that stuff? <laughs> you weren't riding I around town. I wasn't those riding guys, around right? town. I, oh. I, they did that. Oh, those I, guys. You weren't with them on I that. Wasn't, I, was, I was in the house while they did it, okay. so I was witnessing it, but I was like going, this is hilarious. And, and, and the great lesson that Danny's teaching right now, too, is this, though. You, you, you go play. There's a lot of places you can play. But you go play where you fit in and feel comfortable and feel like you're going to be part of a culture and an atmosphere that's going to make you better and and all of that. That's it. Sounds like that's how you made your decision. Is where you felt comfortable. Yeah. Well, I mean, I had been on many uh, recruiting trips, and you know, I won't say the school, but I mean, there's one school I go there, and like the two best players are trying to sell me cocaine. You know, just in contrast, it was a different time. It was, yeah. you know, and. But, you know, I obviously didn't want to go there right? and and play that. Obviously, they didn't get a memo of who they're bringing in for a uh, recruiting trip. <laughs> no. But, um, you know, the BYU experience, yeah, it's changed my life forever. I've never once doubted that that was the right call. Fantastic. What a story. Yeah. All right, you ready to hit him up with five quick yeah, questions? Yeah, so we just do these five quick questions. And we got Brian on the clock, and he's getting yep. antsy, so, so we got to get him in here. So, um, And you don't even think about him. You just answer him. First thing that comes to your head, your favorite sports movie. Um, remember the Titans. Nice. It's one of my favorite football, but I mean, Chariots of Fire. Oh, that's a great one too. Hey, you know what? Is that, that a, first, a sports that's book? I think that's a sport. Of fire. Yeah. yeah. 
That uh, is our first chariot to fire. See, like he, see, this is Danny's not. What about not, bad news bears? Oh, bad news bears. That's Which a one? True, the old school one no, or the, the new I one? I think Walter Mathau. Yeah. Bad yes. news bears with the with the shortstop Tanner. My, my Tanner. I have a son named Tanner, and yeah, I was all excited because of the you know the personality on Bad News Bears. Oh man, the kid that got in fights with everybody. Wouldn't leave the field. <laughs> that guy's classic. So, see, you you didn't go with a standard basketball guy answer of Hoosiers, which uh, is I great. I mean, ba- Hoosiers might be my favorite basketball. Yeah, it's great, but I love Char- Chariots yeah. of Fire as a classic. I think Marie too. Osmond's was Hoosiers. Yeah, right Marie's was Hoosiers. Yeah. So Hoosiers is tough to beat. Yep. Favorite singer or band? Hmm. I'm I'm a country music guy. I mean, I grew up on the Beatles and Rolling Stones. I, I liked as a kid, but um, I think, and I still listen to a lot of music from the '70s and '80s. But I'm a country music guy, and uh, so I would probably say, um, I'm bra- I'm brain- Garth, Garth, Garth Garth Brooks. Brooks. Yeah. I thought you were going to go Keith Urban on that. No, Garth, Garth Brooks. Okay. Brenda's going to say, "See, hun, Garth. Danny's got it. He knows Garth Brooks because yeah. I'm like." Grew up in New York, so I'm like a hip hop kid. She's like, "What's yeah. wrong with you?" I, I was interviewing Garth Brooks one time, and I asked him. I said, "Do you still get nervous?" And he had just sold out four shows up in Salt Lake, and he goes, "I get nervous every single night." I go, "Really?" He goes, "I'll be honest with you. Every time before I come out behind the curtain, I think to myself, what if no one's there?'" <laughs> I go, "Seriously, you've sold them all." He goes, "It doesn't matter. Those feelings of I'm about to come out. What if no one's there?" It's interesting how entertainers think. Right. Yeah. He's yeah. He, he's 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 one best. of the best. He's like, yeah, I finally got good enough that I could actually hire a real guitar player instead of playing it myself. Like he's <laughs> just like he's the best. So, favorite breakfast cereal? Uh, I mean, I'm a I'm a shredded wheat guy with like yeah, I'm a shredded wheat. Wait, guy. do you do the frosted though? Please tell me, do the frosted? I don't do the frosted. I mean, as, oh. a, as a kid, you know, probably it was Lucky Charms. But, okay, now we're talking. But I think yeah, as an adult, it's been more. Um, non-frosted wheat. That's like that's healthy. Wheat. That's totally against the trend that's of the show. It's my healthy. wife. It's my wife. That's really all we have. So Michelle's had a good it's influence shredded on wheat. Yeah. this. It's shredded <laughs> wheat. She puts Michelle, a lot of berries can on can you it please, <laughs> please get Danny some Lucky Charms? It's just charms. like serving up hay. It's like serving up some hay. <laughs> we're getting old. We have yeah. to have something. Well, we spice know. it out. We spice the shredded wheat. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, good. Your favorite moment with Charles Barkley? Favorite moment? Wow, we had a lot of fun moments. Um, I think was when we were in the we, in the comp conference finals and beating San Antonio and Charles hitting a jump shot to win it. Um, but you know, every three, my, I played three years with Charles, and he made me laugh every day, every single day, as you guys can imagine. Yes. Oh, but, yeah. but maybe my favorite moment was where this just shows you how much players are going to control. But we have our owner, Jerry Colangelo, there, and who's got a lot of clout as an owner. And we have the whole team and players are there. And um, and I got I got one of the story I just thought of. This is this too good to pass <laughs> up. Okay. So, do. Charles, we're taking a team photo before the game. And so we, we get up there, and these, this, they're setting the stage for, you know, an hour getting ready for this big team photo, the Phoenix Suns. And they click, like, three pictures, and Charles goes, we're done. And they go, no, 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 we got a lot more. We got more lenses. He goes, no, we're done. Like, I'm in charge, not you, and we're done. And he just walked away, and there was no more pictures. <laughs> He's got three takes. You guys, you got to better find one there. And then there's a day where Paul Westfall, so our tip-off is 710 uh, in Phoenix. And, you know, we're all sitting around. It's 30 minutes before tip-off. Everybody's always there. We all kind of stretching, look up at Charles. You know, his uniform's still there. So he hasn't arrived to the arena yet. And so we're just sitting there for another five or ten minutes. We're watching, you know, the pregame film, and no one's saying a word. Finally, Westfall gets up and says, if he's not here by 7.10, he's not starting. By 7.10? <laughs> but if he's not here by tip, yeah. he is not starting. Did he make it? He made it. Yeah, oh, he made it. <laughs> Westfall knew who was in charge. That's exactly oh, that's funny. right. So, Charles in charge. So the, yeah. the last one is, what's a favorite piece of advice you ever got from your dad? Oh, my dad. Wow. Um, I mean, I got so much good advice, but you know, my dad was, he was a, I used to drive up to him in Portland. He'd work like one day a week in Portland, which was like a two hour drive each way. And, um, but I remember one time he was trying to teach me about balance and, you know, he said, you need to have balance in your life. I go, dad, I'm, 
balanced. I play baseball, football, basketball, <laughs> golf. <laughs> it's the four track, seasons. And track. And he's, but, uh, you know, we opened the 252 where it says Jesus increased in wisdom, stature, and a favor with God, man. And um, I've never forgotten that. And that was, a, that was a driving thing for me throughout my life. To keep balance. That's a good one. That's, That's a awesome. great one. The so. great Danny Ainge with us. Uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for having appreciate me. appreciate it. being able to visit and we, we, when do all we, that When stuff. we started this thing, this is what we envisioned because, you know, in our normal jobs and normally when you get interviewed, we, we got a four-minute sound bite or a six-minute sound bite. We never just get together with friends and just get to hang out and reminisce, and we sure appreciate you doing it with us. It's well, so, so fun. I'm excited that I'm being run out of the table by B. Sand. B. Oh, Sand. He's, yeah, he's, he's getting anxious. He's ended some good days for me here yes. and there throughout I, the years. But I tell you, as a 12 year old boy, and I've told you this before, as a ball boy, a seventh grader from Lake Ridge Junior High, but a ball boy for the team, and, and I'd rebound for you before these games, and you're the big star on campus, and I'm just a punk kid that I'm pretty sure I got ball boy because of my dad was running the career club. But. Uh, <laughs> But I remember you know, just always asked me about my day and kind of grill me on girls and my my life in seventh grade. And and uh, that's where I learned. And now we have kids and we've seen that with others is that the impact that a, an athlete can have on on somebody else just by giving them the time of day. And so that took place in 1979. But I, I it's still important to me. Even though to you, I was just one of the 22,000 in the house that day. It's just interesting well, uh, how we do that. I've always liked kids. There's, I still like feel, I love talking with the kids. It's fun. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Danny Ainge with Danny, us. Guys. Thanks so much. You bet. We're going to we're gonna have you Thanks turn you, the brother. microphone over to the man right here, Brian Santiago. Um, the great Danny Ainge. Next week, Jay Hill, the defensive coordinator, will be with us. And Trent Pratt, the baseball coach. Gordon Eakin will join us two weeks from tonight.